Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Manny Roman, CEO of PIMCO. Manny, great to see you. Thank you for having me, Andy. So most people have heard about PIMCO, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about the firm. What do you guys do, and how do you make your money? So we are based in Newport Beach, California. We are 52 years old, and we run about $2 trillion focusing on fixed income in many different ways. And so what I mean by fixed income is government bonds, corporate bonds, high yield, bank loans, municipal, private credit, real estate. And so it's an extensive view of the word fixed income. Right. And it's mostly institutional money, right? Actually, we have a very big retail business where we deal with many financial advisors, especially in the US. And so our business is very evenly split mm. between institution and what we call global wealth management. And so we deeply care about financial advisors and what their needs right, are, right. especially when markets are difficult like they are right now. Thank you for clarifying. 98% fixed income though, right? Only a That's tiny sliver of, of equities. And you said founded 52 years ago, one of the founders was Bill Gross, I think, right? It was That's only correct. $12 million, I understand, at least what it started with. And you've got, you know, that over $2 trillion today. What accounts for the firm's incredible growth, do you think, Manny? I think performance. I think we have a culture of trying to generate alpha. And we have a business model where we're not trying to be all things to all people. But we say, if we perform, they will come. And the, the hard thing when you run an asset management business is to make sure that you have ways to sustain performance over a long period of time and be able to capture opportunity through the business cycle. And we have 350 investment professionals. And the way we generated Alpha 50 years ago is very different from the way we generate Alpha today and the way that someone will generate Alpha 50 years from now. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. I mean, first of all, generating alpha, of course, is excess returns over a benchmark or over an index. And of course, you guys are active managers as opposed to just index index managers. So how do you generate those excess returns? By a variety of ways, but we are pretty unique in a sense that we have the same investment process for 52 years. We have an investment committee led by my partner and friend, Dan Iverson. So we have a global macro view in terms of where we think the various economies in the globe are going to go to. And then we shape this macro view and translate it into portfolio by picking the appropriate instruments. And a great thing about fixed income and a question that I think financial advisors may have is, how come good fixed income manager beat the benchmark while equity manager really struggle? And I always say the reason why we can beat the benchmark is the biodiversity of the fixed income market is so wide hmm. that one can find the right securities to buy to achieve excess return over a benchmark. And it's, you know, not all of the money we run is versus a benchmark. Some of it is on an absolute basis, I mentioned before more private fund, where we try to generate 12 to 15%, that's really an absolute return. But the concept and the tools we have and the way we construct portfolio and the way we use risk is the same. You know, it's interesting because a lot of people think that bonds are monolithic and that equities are more diverse. So it's interesting to hear you say that bonds have all sorts of different asset classes and features and, and opportunities as well. And, right? and the fact that any company has 30 to 50 bonds that they have issued in various currency, various maturity, various mm. form. Right. And there's a whole mortgage market. There's right. a whole student loan market. There's a whole municipal market. There's right. endless amount of treasury. Inflation has come down um, pretty sharply, especially last month. Do you think that that signals that the Fed either has won the fight against inflation or is certainly in control of the battle? I think the Fed has one of the tools and has done what was the right thing to do, which was 
to raise rates. And I truly believe that they are very data dependent and they will want, they will raise rates for as long as they need to. They are on the path to lo lower rates and lower inflation. How fast it goes, of course, you have to be incredibly humble about what we don't know. The labor market is a big question mark. The labor is very tight. You would like to see weakness in labor. You would like to see unemployment go from 3.7 to 4.5. But there's a lot of variable like immigration that we don't know about. And so all of these things eventually translate into a macroeconomic output. And that's what we will see. A lot of people have been pointing to the inverted yield curve and saying, OK, the recession's coming. It's about to come. But they've been saying that for a while. What's your take on the yield curve? Well, uh, if you're a financial advisor, you have this sort of dichotomy. On the one hand, you look at the stock market and the stock market is up 18 percent for the S&P 500 or something like 34 percent for the Nasdaq. And then you see this inverted yield curve. And, and in, it's difficult to believe that both can be right at the same time. Inverted yield curve tells you historically that it's more likely than not that you have a recession. Now, recession may be fairly shallow. It may mean a few quarter of negative real growth. Very hard landing is incredibly unlikely. But should the economy slow down? Absolutely. And I think the other variable that I think maybe people sometimes don't think about is the SVB and the First Republic situation has been a wake-up call for the regulatory side of the U.S. government. And so banks will have higher capital requirement, everything being equal. Accordingly, they will lend less. Commercial real estate is potentially an issue. And so there'll be less credit available in the economy, and that should slow down everything else being equal gross. So many things to pick up on there. You mentioned commercial real estate. The Wall Street Journal had a story a few months ago about some exposure that PIMCO had to commercial real estate and said that was a problem. How big a deal is that for PIMCO? Let me sort of reverse into this. Mm -hmm. they, Real estate is a very big asset class, and there are many different type of real estate. This is something which really matters to us. We think there are plenty of attractive investment opportunity. And the situation that you're mentioning is in a private fund. Private fund have long lockup structure, and so it's giving us the opportunity to refund the asset and work on it and make sure we end up on the other side of the equation mm -hmm. with a better situation. But one of the lessons, having done this for a very long time, is you need to buy asset with the right level of liquidity in the fund. And so illiquid assets need to be in a private fund. They shouldn't be in mutual fund. And you have time to deal with the situation and work the problem, if any, out. You mentioned the stock market being up, what, 18%, 16 17 18%, depending on what day, with the way the market's going, a year to date. What is your take on that vis-a-vis -vis Jay Powell's strategy? Uh, does that mean that Jay Powell's strategy is not working, that raising rates is not dampening the economy enough? And what is your take on Jay Powell and, and his monetary policy generally? So the stock the stock market is has its own his own his own way of behaving and 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 being a University of Chicago person part of me wants to say that it's pretty efficient. We we have a situation where starting at the beginning of the year there was a view that earnings were going to really disappoint, and it has not been the case. And you can look at various strategists and sort of assess what they think about earnings, and you have very different camp. Some think that earnings are turning and we're going to have a difficult next six months. 
and some are saying that we're going to have a soft landing and everything is good. It could be anything between these two views. Mm -hmm. I would notice that if you're financial advisors, the, the reality is the growth in the market has been six stocks. It's been very, very narrow and the stocks are not cheap. So the real question is how much exposure do you want to have to equity given the fact that I think it's fair to say that the stock market has done much better than anyone expected and is it time to sort of take some money off the table and think about ways to diversify your exposure away. I want to get back a little bit, Manny, to how the firm works in terms of investing strategy. You have sort of a top-down view, but also a bottoms-up view with regard to specific portfolio managers, right? How is that integrated? So we want to have the experience of every client at PIMCO to be consistent with one top-down view and one top-down risk limit that then impose on the organization. Mandates are obviously very different. Some people want very low risk product. Some people want higher risk product. Some people want international diversification. We have a very big and broad international business. And so I don't want to simplify what we do with one size fit all. We do a lot of different things, but the framework and the global view is the same. We have, as you know, this quarterly forum where we all meet together, discuss macro views and individual securities. That's when our global advisory board chaired by Ben Bernanke comes and we contrast our view with outside people. We have outside speakers. It's an internal event, but we really try to have one common view about what we think the global environment is. And then they are tactical views. Right now, mortgages are cheap, so you'd rather have mortgages probably than treasury. And then we try to rate the opportunity on a bottom-up basis. And then you try to construct the portfolio together and think about the risk and the liquidity of the various portfolio that you build for different type of clients. And, and, and I think, I think mm -hmm. there's an enormous amount of work in terms of the risk part. And when you think about the big investment we make, we make a lot of investment in quant. We make a lot of investment in artificial intelligence for that reason. And I think that's the, that's the, that's the reason why I think we try to think very, very carefully about how portfolio are constructed. Yeah, so what are you guys telling your portfolio managers right now? How have things changed just over the past 12 months? What's the most current thinking? The first thing you say to yourself is you have to be incredibly humble in terms of the market, what you know and what you don't. 2022 was a lesson that the fixed income market and the stock market corrected more than what anyone expected. So right now we are in a very target rich environment. The first thing we say to our portfolio manager is now is the time to deliver alpha because there's just so many different things to do. And that's not always the case. You know, you have a period of time, 2006, 2007, where someone like PIMCO didn't do much because we thought everything was overpriced and we foresaw the housing crisis. But now there's a lot to do. Hmm. And so alpha is not constant over time. There are moments where you can have significant opportunity to add value. Now is the time. Now is the moment where we need to shine. Then what's the right level of risk to take? Where do we want to put money to work? How do we do it? And then think about how we construct portfolio to deliver what it says on the box. And I always say, we need to do what it says on the box. There can be no surprise. I think we, we try to be incredibly diligent about what we achieve. We're here to serve our financial advisors and you know, hopefully we do a good job. You mentioned Alpha several times, Manny. Um, you've been CEO since 2016. What's your Alpha? What do you bring to the firm? What have you done so far? What's been your mandate? And what do you aim to do going forward? My biggest Alpha is the fact that it's a partnership. There are 3,000 people who work for PIMCO. I have a wonderful partner in Dan Iverson. There's a great group of people working in the firm. It is all about one firm, 
and everyone being replaceable. And what I mean by this is we underestimate the power of an organization, the fact that we need to heavily invest in the next generation of investors, and the fact that the best ideas often come from younger people. We need to give them room to grow. We need to give them room to deliver returns for our clients. And that's what Dad and I do. And I think we're both a big believer that the firm is always bigger than any individual. So I would very much minimize my contribution and just say, we both believe that it's all about the common structure and the common number of people that we have and, and how good they are. And final question, Manny. You mentioned uh, you studied at the University of Chicago. You were also from France, though, originally. That's and correct. so I'm wondering what your take is on the French economy. The biggest challenge, I think, for any European country is to recognize that they are caught between America and then the growth in China and Asia. And to have a industrial policy where it makes sense and they can compete on a global basis. And it's very difficult because you find that competing in the industrial sector has become very, very difficult. If I wake you up in the middle of the night and call you and say, Andy, give me the name of a European tech company, you may struggle a little. Tech has been a very American phenomenon based on the West Coast. And I think that's one of the challenges that Europe has, to basically find an industrial policy where over the next 30 years, Europe can compete against the US and the Asian bloc in terms of delivering product and delivering services that are competitive on a global basis. And, 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 and France is no different. So that's the issue. And of course, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of France or the prime minister of Germany fully understand these things and trying to compete on a global basis, but it's not uh, easier said than done. Manny Roman, CEO of PIMCO, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me once again. Mm -hmm.